one single bee over the course of her lifetime is going to go out and gather nectar and pollen, and she's going to make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey over thousands and thousands of flights to visit millions of flowers. All she's going to do is one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey, just drops of honey. And the fact that we have gallons and gallons of honey on our shelves in the supermarket or at the farmer's market, you have to think about how hard those bees have worked to make that honey. It just, it, it's, it's sort of mind blowing, it's cool. One of the reasons I got into beekeeping is because I wanted to teach my kids about the value of where their food comes from. And bees are a huge part of that equation. They pollinate over a third of the crops that we eat every day. I always remember uh, when I first started working with bees and they were really aggressive. They told me what to do and I had to understand and, and listen and not do uh, things that they, they told me not to do. I make the best effort that I can to do what the bees would do in nature. That's kind of the main thing is to give them a really happy, uh, a really good home and then in a really smart location so there's, there's good forage around. And then just observe and, and as the bees tell you what they need, give them what they need. One of the reasons that commercial beekeepers work almost exclusively with the European honeybees is because of the size of the colony. You get 30,000 bees in a colony of European honeybees. Within a beehive, there are three different types of bees. The most important one, everyone's heard of the queen bee. Her job is to lay eggs. That's really her only job. The other bees that are important are the worker bees, and those are all female. Almost all the bees in the hive are worker bees. The workers, they'll, they'll either be uh, nurse bees, feeding larvae and feeding young. They'll uh, be building comb. They'll be um, cleaning the hive. They'll be warming the hive. Those worker bees are the ones that you see out on the flowers. They become foragers. They go out, they collect the nectar, they collect the pollen that they bring back to the hive. Some are guard bees. They, they, they sit along the, the entrance of the hive and they check everyone, kind of like a bouncer. So everyone that comes in has to have a, a certain scent to them. And if you aren't from that hive, they, they attempt to block you. If you're a wasp, a moth, or a beetle, or something else, their job is to like try to prevent uh, pests or predators or someone coming in to get a free meal. And then there's the drone bees. Those are the males. And their job is to go out and look for a virgin queen and mate with that bee. The drones do nothing else. They don't forage, they don't even own a stinger, so they can't protect the hive, they just kind of clog it, and uh, they make lots of noise. It's kind of funny to, to think that drones are just kind of like the big couch potatoes in, in the hive, and the, the, the workers actually will attempt to drag them out, so a lot of energy is wasted on, on the male of this, of this species. You can be a beekeeper and you could be five years old or you could be 105 years old because beekeeping is one of those things that you, you don't, it's not such a big animal or big thing that you, you can't function. It, it's something that you can do to span your entire lifetime. It's one of those things that if you love to learn and love to keep um, gathering information about something, um, you can do that until, until, the, until the day you die. So. We want to use something like the honeybee system as a model to try to understand anything that's a large biological complex self-organized system um, and honeybees are a good one to use because we do understand something about how those little interactions work at least to some extent. So we see these two signals, the, the waggle dance and the stop signal, that kind of counteract each other. So when a bee goes out and she finds a resource that she finds particularly good. She will come back to the colony and she will tell her sisters essentially where to find that using this waggle dance. So a bee will walk sort of in a straight line and wiggle her butt at the same time that she's walking. And she'll do this for a certain amount of time and the amount of time that she does that corresponds to how far away the resource is. So about one second is equal to about one kilometer. When she gets to the end of that waggle run, she'll stop and she'll kind of turn back and go back to the beginning of where she started that waggle run. 
So now we have a coordinate system, essentially, that the bees can access to understand where to find that resource. So they know how far away it is and they know what direction it is. The stop signal now happens when a bee goes out to a floral resource or any kind of resource and she finds that there's something bad happening there. Number one, if there's a predator and number two, if there is overcrowding at that resource. The stop signaler will then come in and she will headbutt the waggle dancer in the middle of a waggle dance and at the same time as she does that, she vibrates her flight muscles and this will produce a little ee sound and this has the effect of causing the waggle dancer to momentarily freeze. The fact that we're really starting to uncover how those little local interactions drive global colony-wide behavior and how that's functionally adaptive in various ecosystems, um, I, that's, that's fascinating to me. Bees are mysteriously dying. It's called colony collapse disorder. The end of honeybees, the end of pollination, a dire threat to crop. Colony collapse really made big media news, and it was partly the idea of the mysterious disappearance of the bees. But I have to say that it's not so mysterious anymore. Scientists have moved away from calling it colony collapse to calling it poor colony health. So part of the honeybee health work is, you know, what is the effect of pesticides on honeybee learning, on basically their survival, and on their orientation towards the light. They don't necessarily die, but they become briefly hyperactive. But then if you expose them over a longer period of time, what we would call chronic exposure, they might start showing inactivity and become very slow and eventually die. We know that one of the factors influencing honeybee declines and poor colony health is lack of good nutrition. And this manifests in two different ways. Number one, they may not be getting the kinds of nectar that they need because of habitat loss. And number two, because they are used in many cases for agricultural pollination, instead of getting a diverse pollen diet, they are only getting exposed to a monoculture of essentially the same kind of pollen. So it's bad if you have bad nutrition, it's bad if you have pesticide, but it's much, much worse if you have bad nutrition and are exposed to pesticide. We need bees to pollinate very large areas of crops, but it brings up all these issues of, of having a monoculture. So if you could even restore 4%, say, of your field to have these corridors where you would have native plants that would support native insects and also native animals, you could help out the bees and many other communities. Essentially, you are trying to restore, in a very small way, something of the natural ecosystem, and that should be beneficial. The value of bees goes well beyond getting a little bit of honey from them. And it's really critical to our success on this planet in a lot of ways. You find if people have a path to connect with nature, we can care for it. If we get to interact with it closely, now it's a way that we can really understand it. Um, also, understanding something about the natural world and, and kind of the work that I do, which is using this one system to maybe create a general metaphor for how everything works in the biological world. The more of them that we have, the more examples that we have, the better we can understand ourselves. And I think the first thing you have to do is just educate yourself a little bit about all of the amazing things that they can do. The more that we can do to protect all types of bees, the better. <laughs>